Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Freeman Bills. Freeman, welcome. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I think listening to your podcast and the mission that you have and the information you put out is just so fantastic. And I'm excited to try to do my best to, to give what I can here to, to your listeners. Oh, that sounds amazing. And for the for the listener, I just want to describe to them what's on the wall behind you. It says good vibes. Yeah, this is my favorite little, um, it was actually Chris's present from my younger sister. Uh, good vibes. It's just, a, it's, I have a few reminders around me in my life to remind myself of that, to look for the good, uh, enjoy what's around us and really embrace those positive things. And that's, that's one of the many things that I have kind of around that does that. And it's really interesting because we have these curated backgrounds now that for our Zoom calls. Now yours is really balanced. You've got greenery, you've got yellow, you've got good vibes, you've got lovely sort of setting behind you. Is that curated? Is is that something? Oh that yeah. You've... Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. There was there was some serious thought thought that went into that. I I took it into a program and like measured the shelves out and had everything designed. Uh, you can't see obviously because this part looks great. Um, but where my desk is, is in the middle of my room. So the office looks a bit strange from the outer perspective because the desk is just in the middle of the room and nothing else really makes sense, but it works really well for the backdrop. So yeah, it makes a massive difference. And I, uh, behind me, I've got greenery. I think it's just really important to have fresh and bright colors. And as you say, a core message. So Fantastic for bringing that onto the show today. So tell me, what is it you're up to at the moment? What is it you're focusing on, Freeman? The great question. Right now, um, I'm focusing a lot on my current one-on-one -on -one coaching stuff that I'm doing and tweaking that to ensure that I'm always providing kind of the best values that I can to my clients and making sure that it's a very authentic and kind of raw narrative that I'm explaining both in my branding messaging, but also what I'm doing for my clients. Um, that's kind of really the space I'm in right now and what I'm hoping to continue to focus on and sort of provide, really provide as much value as I possibly can. So I've got main goals in my life that are written actually on a whiteboard just in front of me right now. And one of them is uh, it's a change a million lives. So I'm always trying to think of ways that I can kind of do that. Um, how can I have bigger impact and really kind of, yeah, get to that goal of kind of changing a million lives faster and sooner. And what do you want to change them from to? So there's kind of two main goals that I, I kind of, I guess, have sub gold under that. One of them being um, to really kind of cultivate more positivity in our lives. So really right now where we are in this space and in the world right now, there's a lot of negative. There's a lot of negative news, a lot of negative negativity going on. We as human beings are drawn towards that information. Biologically, it's how we're kind of tuned. So really it's to get people to understand to kind of step off of that negative path and get to a more positive one and be more kind of realistic, um, but optimistic at the same time. So a bit more kind of um, realistic optimism, so to speak. So that's kind of the main goal. And then from that is, is this kind of sub goal, just having less stress in our lives because of that. Not, not necessarily less stress. I'm going to kind of counter that a little bit, but just saying less negative impacts from stress would be a good way of putting it, I think. And this is a personal realization that you've gone through yourself to step away from that negative path. It's sort of like, so when I look back, I love this question because when I look back on like why I am doing this, why I'm on this mission of providing more positivity and, you know, um, lessening the negative impacts of stress. If I look back at all the things that I've done in my life, the common thread throughout everything is this undertone of positivity. Now, what I've realized is that that's not a chance happening. Those, that positive person, that positive message, the way that I am, 
is due to a series of habits, a way of living, a certain thing that I do that makes that happen. Um, so it's just kind of like a common thread that I found looking back, doing self-reflection and self, my own self-development that I realized, wait a minute, this isn't something that you just either have or you don't. It's something that you cultivate, it's something that you create. So I created did this term called practical positivity, and that's sort of what I help people to do. Um, and it's sort of just learned through my life, my life lessons of, uh, of how I kind of both got brought up, but then my careers as well. I love that. So it echoes a lot of what I say in terms of building and creating purpose here and and your self-reflection and, and cultivate, cultivation of practical positivity is, is a mature approach. It's But you said you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, so when I look back at my life, so to speak, I've always been that person that people are like, oh, you're so optimistic or you're so grounded. You're so calm in the in the face of a lot of things. I'm the person that a lot of my my family calls kind of when something is going wrong and they, you know, they need somebody to listen or they need advice on something. Um, and oftentimes they're like, oh, how do you remain so kind of level-headed during stuff? Um, and I've just realized that it's a format of kind of working through thoughts that I have that help me kind of structure things properly and not ignore negative things. And I like that you said it's a very kind of mature approach to positivity because I never tell people to like ignore negative thoughts. You know what I mean? Like those things will happen. It's just a matter of working through our negative thoughts. I think that's what makes the big difference. And that's something that I've been able to do in a very systematic approach. And that's what makes me able to be so level-headed is I can have these moments occur, whether there's somebody saying something to me or something happening in my own life, and I can work through them in a much more, um, maybe much more functional way and effective way versus just kind of mindlessly scrambling um, and hoping to kind of crawl over the negative. You come across as a, a, a wise soul, someone who's Thank had you. many lives. <laughs> <laughs> is, what, what, is, what has sort of led you on this path? And, you know, what, if, what is it that you have, like, why are you guiding people in this way? I think... So a long time ago is when I realized that we have really big impact on other people. Um, even in a small little thing that we do, and people will kind of hear this all over the place, but you know, so you do something small, it changes, you know, the course of life for somebody else. And I and I realized that quite early on. I was very fortunate to be one of those children who was sort of raised by a village, so to speak. So I had a lot of amazing mentors. Certainly I had some hardships growing up as well. Um but I had a lot of amazing people in my life that taught me a lot of things. And then I did a lot of traveling as well. So I really experienced the world and made sure that I had like a good understanding of what was going on. I never took a post-secondary course. Um, one of my mentors who has unfortunately now passed um, only last year, actually, uh, he told me, he was like, don't go to school right away. Go travel, go experience the world first, understand what it is that you're looking for, and then maybe go to school after that. So that's what I did, thankfully. And I think that's part of what kind of maybe makes me come across sort of an old soul is that I've had a lot of life experience from doing a lot of things like outside of my comfort zone and stuff like that. But really, I guess to go back to the the question of like, why do I do I do this is because I've seen the impact that it can have on people. And that's just I want to see people live that I, I it. I'm a very empathetic person. So it really bothers me when I see people struggling with something that they don't need to struggle with. And if I can provide an answer, or at least a guiding pathway, to a better outcome for them, then I feel very drawn to do that. So traveling and spending time with people, where in the world did you then realize, actually, I now know and I understand what life's about and what I'm looking for as you were directed to go seek? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard to pinpoint a particular spot where it happened. I know, interestingly enough, I think the first time it came across it, the one that stands out to me anyway, is when people ask me this question, that really is like, yeah, I think that's where the the first kind of roll started to happen. The first ball got pushed down the mountain, so to speak, is actually here uh, in Canada, in my hometown where I grew up. I was working as a, a whitewater rafting guide at the time. And I was going down the river. This is about my first year uh, as a guide. I'd been in, it was a family company. So I've been doing it for a long time. This is my first year actually legally guiding. Uh, I should be 18 to guide in Canada. So I was going down the river with this group group in the, in the raft with me. And we got 
kind of done the more intense section and we're on this very calm bit and the valley opens up in this huge rock feature it's gorgeous um and as we're kind of floating down it's all very peaceful and calm and this kid in front of me turns around and he just says i just want to say thank you i said for what and he said for showing me that somebody my age can do something that they enjoy for a living and i didn't think a whole lot about it at that point in time but i got back to base and i was talking to my mom and i was telling her about this experience she said that group that you took down the river wasn't just a group of kids it was a group of troubled youth from a town nearby these are kids who had never kind of seen this type of experience before and so to have that impact on them they'd only seen kind of like the struggles and they came up from troubled homes and stuff like that so to kind of inspire them in that sense kind of really i think is what kind of started the ball for me in that direction of like, oh, I can have positive change on people that will last, you know, for, for years to come. So that was, wonder, that was really yeah. profound for me. Yeah. I can, I can see that. And I wonder if you had known before you set out on that particular trip, guiding them that they were troubled, would you have changed your approach at all? Yeah, it's interesting. That's an interesting question. I'm, I mean, I want to say just by kind of self-reflection and what I understand about about psychology that I probably would have, you know, I maybe would have, I think two things, I probably would have either been maybe more muted in the, in the things that I was saying because of that strange barrier that I would have psychologically created or I would have tried too much. You know what I mean? It would have been, and it wouldn't have been natural in the way that I was coming across. It's like, oh, I'm going to change these kids' lives. And I would have like really tried to push that message onto them. And then it would have just come across as, you know, a bit fake almost so yeah i think it would have had a massive uh difference for sure so what is it about you said there was an intense section what is it about water particularly or nature that humbles us in this way i'm so glad you asked this we had a huge brainstorming session a few years ago many years ago now actually um on what made whitewater rafting so special because we've been doing it for decades at this point in time and we realized that there's something that brings people together. It creates this camaraderie that just doesn't exist in different scenarios. And what it was, and this actually came back to many psychological concepts, but when you go through sort of a combined struggle with a group of people, that creates a bond and a connection that you often can't get. So when you do something like whitewater rafting or any sort of activity in that sense it's very similar oddly enough some people might be able to connect with like an escape room maybe so when you as a group of people go out and you struggle through something together and you overcome that struggle and you you attain a victory or you achieve a goal of the group you build this level of togetherness that isn't possible in another way so it's interesting when you go and do an outdoor experience like that for many people especially when it comes to whitewater rafting that's an experience they've never had before. Something incredibly different, incredibly unique. And it, even though it's very controlled and it's very safe, it feels like you're overcoming these obstacles as a team because you are. So I think that's what makes it so truly special is that you're getting together with a group of people and you're overcoming a, what would seem as an unsurmountable obstacle and you're doing it and you're having fun when you're doing it. And you come up the other side as just this like euphoric, fun, amazing feeling. And that's what's so truly unique and special about it and do you know what happened to any of those particular troubled youth on I the don't, trip i don't no uh, i wish this is before i had um like a lot of my guests i'm now connected to on social medias and stuff like that this is before i was doing a lot of that so i unfortunately i have no idea where those people have ended up i hope one day maybe i'll have one of those interesting stories to tell where um at a conference something like that somebody will come up and be like i was that kid uh, but Right now, I'm still hoping for that. <laughs> so you've talked about being raised by a village, having lots of amazing people who have helped mentor you. You've talked about this camaraderie and this togetherness and this connection that you have found through your work and in, in different forms, no matter all the way through from, from being quite young. People are, seem to be at the heart of your purpose. Tell me more about that. That's something that definitely I realized fairly late on in my kind of in my career journeys that it's people that I that truly draw me and making people better. That's really what I like doing. And that I think that started with the guiding. It started to 
pivot a little bit back, I guess, when I discovered um, user experience design and the psychology behind that. And I went, okay, this is neat. Now I can kind of design things to help people. And then I kind of got into marketing. I said, oh, well, this is interesting. But marketing is really just finding solutions for people and then showing them those solutions in attractive ways. That's a very simple way of kind of putting what effective marketing is. But then I realized that at the core of all of that is people. It's how people think. It's why people think certain ways. It's what makes people feel certain things. And I, that's what I really became quite attached to. And then I discovered, thankfully, through self-development, I discovered a lot of positive psychology. And that's really, I think, where the roots of like my coaching and my understanding of helping people in a very direct way started to come. When I realized that we have this understanding, so many of us are driven to be successful. We all want to be successful. We all want to be kind of known as this person who's completed X, Y, Z thing, right? The problem is we've been taught and trained in society that what happens is we become successful and then we can be happy. Or unfortunately, the truth and the data even points the opposite direction. It's like, no, you have to find happiness and then that will lead you to be more successful. Um, and when I started to understand all of this stuff and to me, it made very natural sense. It was like, yep, this, I understand this to its core fundamentally. And I've always told other people this as well. When you find something in your life that you're like, this is, this just makes sense. Why aren't, why isn't everybody doing this this way? That's the thing that you understand to your core. And that's the thing that you need to figure out how to have impact with, with other people. So for me, that's what it was. It was like, cool. I need to, I, I understand that happiness leads us to being healthier, happier, more successful. So how can I help people do that? And for someone who said that they hadn't studied post-secondary, it seems to be like <laughs> you are the biggest learner and studier of all things out there. So tell me, yes, no, not a formal qualification, but what, what does the informal learning lead you to instead? Yeah, it's, I mean, I have, I've always been a curious individual. I was, um, one of those kids for sure when I was younger, like just didn't stop asking why. Um, my parents can certainly attest to that. And I think that's carried right into my adulthood uh, and into my life now where I'm like, well, I want to know why though. Like why that, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm never happy enough with just the, the root answer. I'm like, no, no, I want to go like, what's the level deeper? And I do that with my own self-reflection as well. So learning, thankfully, thankfully I read a lot. Um, and I used to read a lot of fiction. And recently, well, not recently now, I guess three years ago or so, I started to pivoting into reading a lot more nonfiction and self-development and autobiographies and just read and kept reading and kept reading. And then that turned into like listening to podcasts and listening to experts on podcasts. And I think we are in this day and age where we have access to so much information, so much, like an, an abundance that we'd never be able to fully get. And it just means that we have an opportunity to if you want to learn something and if you want to figure something out, like you can, all that information is there and accessible for you. Uh, and thankfully, my curious nature, I've just leaned into it. And um, I found something that I'm passionate about and just kept reading and just kept reading. So it's it's given me this really good understanding, a base understanding of really human psychology and why we think the way we do. And tell me more about why you're doing what you're doing and what the mission is in more detail, I know you shared that you you want to change a million lives, but you know, how is that? How are you going to track that even? Yeah, it's. I mean, that's a very arbitrary number, right? I mean, a million could be half a million. It could be three million. It could be a billion. It's it's just sort of a goal to keep me in the, in the right direction. <clears throat> I mean, I guess the, the the big the big thing, if I were to boil it down to something, is it really bothers me to see people in struggle that is not unnecessary. So for a lot of it is like helping people through unnecessary struggle and, and giving them a framework that they can have and they can work on that will enable them in the future to never have to go through that unnecessary struggle. And there's a lot of necessary struggle. And I don't want to, I don't want to say that we're never going to struggle because I think that some struggle is important, but it's the unnecessary struggle. That, that really gets me. And so I think a lot of it is that, is, the, is helping people understand that. Um, and right now it's, it's with my one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, but I'm currently writing a book right now, um, which 
may or may not be out by the time this launches. We'll see how much time I get to write here in the next few months. But that'll be kind of part of that path doing that. Um, and also a lot of what I do is, is about that. A lot of the content I drop on social media is um, a lot of the the podcasts that I'm, I'm either on or hosting is about that. It's about making, giving people the tools to not have to uh, struggle unnecessarily. And I was going to pick up on that discernment between necessary and unnecessary struggle. And you you kind mm. of highlighted it there that there is struggle that is necessary in life. And and actually, you, you know, you started off by sharing that the combined struggle is where you build that togetherness piece mm. as well. So it is a, a part of life that you, you can't live without struggle at some point. Completely. Yeah. And I think that's part of the part of what's sold in sort of mainstream society, which is a bit of the problem, is that you can attain this level of never struggling again, right? That's almost what we see is like being successful means that I never have to struggle again or that all my problems will be solved. And that's just, that's just a fallacy. That's never going to happen. It doesn't matter. I don't care how much money you have, how much social status you have. Never having problems again is just unattainable. So it's understanding, okay, I will have problems. How do I set myself up best to deal with the problems that will come so that they have the least negative impact on my life. I think that's what people need to be looking more at. And with this constant undertone of positivity that's been there from, from a, you said it's not a chance happening. Mm. And I just want to sort of pick up on, on the, the luck and chance that actually does happen in our life. But also that is, which is, you, you said that it's down to habits and making things happen. Yeah, I mean, there definitely is. I won't say that there isn't some arbitrary amount of luck and chance that happened in people's lives. I think we give too much credit to it. Um, I certainly know that a lot of people are like, oh, you're so fortunate to kind of be, you know, where you are and doing what you're doing. And it's like, no, I, I, this is on purpose. I, I made the things and did the things that put me where I am. So that's kind of a bit of a, a thing with luck that I think people maybe don't understand. And then it gives them a caveat to be like, oh, well, I just haven't got lucky enough yet. It's like, no, you need to make more opportunities in your life is what you need to be doing. So that's that sort of thing. When it comes to being more positive, I realized through the studying and, and through watching people and stuff like that, so many people have this belief that they're like, oh, I'm just not a positive person. I'm just not wired that way. And it's like, well, that's just not true. Like, that's not how our brains work. You're not just a positive or just a negative person. And they've, there's some interesting numbers. Depending on the study you look at, it's either between 15 and 25% of your kind of disposition, let's call it, is kind of coded in your genes. So there is 15 to 25% that you are either predisposed or to be either cynical or optimistic. But that leaves a whole range between 75 to 85% that you have control over of how your personality is, of how you're going to approach the world. And you can change that throughout your life. Again, the fallacy that we are locked in after the age of 12 or 14 or whatever, and that's now our personality. It's like, no, that's not even close. Like our brains aren't even finishing developing until we're 25, our prefrontal cortex. And even after that, they've proven that we can change kind of how that those neural pathways operate, which changes how our behaviors and how our habits are. And I've discovered through kind of my own self-development and obviously reading all these books and listening to all these people that what changes that behavior and what changes that personality is our habits. So if we can cultivate positive habits and positive, healthy life choices, we begin to change the way that we approach the world. We begin to change the way our personality comes across and we change our behavior. One of my biggest things that people say that probably irks a few people, but a lot of people are like, oh, happiness is a choice. And I'm like, Okay, yes, but choosing to be happy doesn't make you happy. Choosing to be happy sets you on the path to being happy. And I akin it to, you can't just be like, oh, well, if you want a house, you just choose to have a house. Well, that doesn't get you a house, but it does give you the intent to build a house. So I think it's the same thing with happiness. I think that we can choose to be happy or we can choose to be more positive, but that just sets our intent in the right direction. We still have to get the tools and the skills to build that happiness, which doesn't have an end goal. It's not like a house where you build it and it's done. Um, happiness is more of a journey that you just continually walk on. 
So tell me, you said you read a lot and you've mentioned habits and James Clear's Atomic Habits springs mm-hmm. to your mind. Have there been any particular books that have changed your direction thinking and influenced you in some way? Three, four. <laughs> four major books, I think, that have been pivotal um, to sort of my mental shift, so to speak. Um, I'm actually going to break them down into a couple categories. I think that'll be easier for people. The two that started it for me were autobiographies that made me realize that life that we, when we look at people who are, as far as we're concerned, successful or they've made it, those people are just regular individuals. So when I read Will Smith's book Will and um, Matthew Mahon- Matthew Mahonahay's book Green Lights, uh, I listened to the audio both because it was by them and it was just made it a lot more enjoyable. So I highly recommend that. That was the first crack in the door, I guess. That went, my brain went, oh, hold on, these people are just like me. They're not special. They weren't born any differently. Heck, they even had maybe harder upbringings than even I have, but yet they've attained, you know, what we would call successful. Um, So that was probably where that first opened. From there, I started reading a lot of self-development. Two major books, I would say, changed how I go about doing what I'm doing. One of them being Atomic Habits by James Clear, which should be on everybody's shortlist to read. 100%. I followed that book up immediately with a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And those two books, I think, set the foundation for me of like, okay, how do I now create the life that I'm looking for? How do I build the habits? How do I stop doing the shallow and the unnecessary work to make things start to really happen? And then the biggest pivotal book that made me understand positive psychology and the path that I'm currently on with my coaching is this book that's actually behind me right there, which is called um, The Happiness Advantage. And that's by, by Sean Aker. And that he breaks down the data and the science behind a lot of what I've, we've been chatting about here on this podcast about that, the positive psychology and the data that actually backs up the fact that it's our happiness that leads us to being more successful and how, when we feel better and we have more energy, we're more creative, we see more opportunities, we go out and we do more. And that's ultimately what, you know, makes more to go back to luck. The more that you're looking for opportunities, the more that you're making them in your life, the more chances you are to get lucky, I guess the bigger ratio you have um, in your life to be, to hit luckiness, I guess. So I made that five books just to check. Yeah, yeah so we, <laughs> it was five. So we had the two autobiographies. I haven't read Will yeah. Smith's one. What I have re- I have listened to Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Mm-hmm. And my goodness, is that an experience? You, you really yes. do lose track of everything around you. So probably an advisory not to even drive listening to that because you are so focused on every word that he shares. I, I mm. went walking around with a dog and my kid, I transported to all sorts of places that he takes you to. So descriptive. I have no idea how he can remember in so much detail, so many moments in his life, but it is beautiful, really great book. And I also haven't read uh, Deep Work by Cal Newport. So I'm looking forward mm. to that one as well. Um, the Happiness Advantage also. So there's a couple there on my reading list. And I think it's, it's so interesting to hear the different books because you hear that the staple one so uh, yes james clear atomic habits is a really big read yeah as is the the seven habits of highly successful people by stephen covey that they're, they're the ones that tend to fall from most people when they talk about personal development and the influential books and that there are many more but it's so mm. refreshing to hear a couple of new books that have been influential for you yeah and i think it is fun to look back at my path of how I got to here, right? And and sort of connect the dots. And there's that famous um, Steve Jobs quote, right? That you can never connect the dots looking forward. You can only do them looking backwards. And that's what I always kind of tell people when they begin to, you know, they're like, oh, I want to get to here. And I'm like, getting to somewhere is very challenging to tell you what the footsteps are going to be to get there, right? Just, you know, look for the next thing that is interesting to you that is in that direction. So I'm a huge believer of this whole idea of like understanding what your core values are. And then when you get to an indecision, look at your core values and go, which one of these aligns closest to my core values? That's the direction I'm going to start going. And then at least you've made a decision and it's probably in the right direction because you're following your core values. It might not be the right decision or the best decision maybe, but it's certainly a decision in the right direction. And then you're still just moving forward. Because I couldn't say that reading Will Smith or, or listening to Will Smith and, and 
uh, Matthew McConaughey would have led me to positive psychology. There's no way I could have connected those dots, but, but that's what ended up happening um, eventually. Right. So that's just always my piece of advice to give to people, right? Just understand those core values, ask yourself, you know, why are these things important to me? What am I mainly what's, what's important? Why is it important? And then use that as your, as your guiding beacon when you come to hard decisions or little ones, like which book to read. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of your guiding beacon and your core values, would you mind sharing them with us? Yeah, I would love to. So one of the biggest ones for me, and I think a lot of people share this one, right? But like just sheer honesty and and, and authenticity is a huge core beacon of mine. Uh, I grew up in a small town, which means that I grew up with that understanding of everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows what you're doing. Everybody knows when you're doing it before you know you're going to do it, right? So And weirdly enough, even though I transferred into big centers and big cities, that still remains true to me. So like my sort of one of my core values is just is sheerly like who I am is so important to be true and authentic and what I do. And I have to do with honesty um, because otherwise people were going to know. Right. Um, And so my sort of reputation, I hold very, very close. So that would be one of them um, for sure. Curiosity. Um, is certainly a core value of mine. Uh, I love being curious. I love knowing why. Uh, and that's a big one. And then I think the third one, if I were to have to boil the top three down, um, the third one is just, you know, how do I be more positive? Um, and I continually chase those things. So you can't see, but I've, I'm writing down some notes as I'm talking. And I had underlined as I was going along, practical, authentic, curious, and positive. <laughs> so it's really, it's really interesting that um, those are the sort of words that are jumping out of me as I'm going along and just saying, you know, what is it that this journey has shown me? And it is those, those key words of, of that you've just shared in your values. So it's, you know, it, the conversation has even been in alignment with your values. I love that. I'm, I'm so glad that practical became one of the ones you underlined. Because I think that's where a lot of people fall off. Um, a lot of us like to have grand goals and things, but if we're not being practical and we're not being structured to get that to get to that point, then it it doesn't matter, right? What's that that famous quote, which is like, um, "Dreams without goals are just dreams," right? Like you have to have goals, you have to take action. Um, so yeah, I'm huge on, like I said, practical positivity. I think is what people need to be more aware of. And you're aware because you're you're a listener of the podcast, but every five episodes, I have my reflections with actions. And, and it is exactly that. You know, it's not just the fact that I've listened to these stories and I've taken on board the, the sort of interesting moments, but I've then got on to see, well, how is this actually going to make a difference to me? And what can I do to affect that change? Mm. Yeah, which must be really, really nice for you to have that level of, of self-reflection. I know that self-reflection has been like such core thing to have in, in life. And I think if people can start cultivating their own self-reflection, it, it that really starts to open some doors. So opening doors with your positive psychology, your curiosity, your practicality that you're helping people to pave the way forward to wherever they want to go. What is coming up for you in the immediacy of your, your world right now? I think Coming up, the, the biggest thing coming up right now will be my book. Um, I'm writing, for sure, certainly writing my book. Uh, it came from this concept of like, I can only have so much impact in one-on-one coaching. Um, and as much as I love doing it, it's not going to have that big, big change. Um, so I want to ha- have the chance to give people sort of some understanding of the framework that I have to, that I've developed to help people. Um, and where it comes from and why it works. And that's really what the book will be about is how is it that I have, how is it that I cultivate positivity in my life, right? What are the, what are the three steps that make it actually work? How can you develop those three steps or use them, so to speak, um, in your own life and why, and why they work? Um, the, a little bit of the data behind it as well. And who do you want to pick up and read this book? I mean, I feel like this is what everybody says, but I think any, anybody really, but really it's people who, people who have hit a point in their life where they're asking themselves that question of like, how do I be happier? I think this book is the answer to that. It would be, you know, this is how you be happier. This is how you have less negative impacts um, from your stress. And this is how you really start to make the easy changes to a happier life. 
And do you have a working title at the moment for it? Yeah, the working title right now is um, A Happier, Healthier You, The Three Simple Steps to um, a More Positive Life. Or a positive life, I think more is not in there. I, I, I love it. It's going to be great. And I really look forward to uh, discovering how a happier, healthier you will will sort of progress the book even. And, and as things evolve, you know, every every day we learn more, life changes, dynamic shift. What is it that has shifted for you more recently? Very recently, um, I, we just had the birth of our first son. Um, so or our first child in general, I should say. And that has obviously shifted things drastically in life. And I knew it would. I mean, I wasn't, I, I didn't go into an ignorant thinking that this is this going to be all hunky dory and life's going to be great. I knew that it was going to have the impact on our lives and what and and sort of what we're looking at. One of the first questions that I got after he was born was, you know, um, what's changing your priorities, right? That's always what people kind of ask, right? What's what's changed? How do you look at things differently now? And I kind of boiled it to this point of like. Everything that I do is still very important to me. All of my 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 impact, my goals in life, the change I want to have in people's lives, still very important to me. But what also became is this new level of priority that I didn't think could exist. It wasn't there. And then now I have this new level of priority, which is my family, right? Um, and mainly, mainly my son. That like nothing else has, I don't want to say that other things have moved down the priority list. But there is now a new level of priority that I didn't think could exist until until he was born. Um, and so that certainly, with that, obviously has shifted my time and what's important um, important to me and what I spend more, more of my time doing. And has it made a difference on how you perceive purpose? I wouldn't say it's made a difference on how I perceive it. It would make a difference in maybe the clarity and the focus of the purpose. So before I was doing a lot of things that weren't directly in line with the purpose or didn't move the needle on the purpose. And now that I have a, a child, I am more aware of how I spend my time. And so I have to be a lot more intentional with the things that I'm doing towards my purpose, um, both so I can get there sooner for, for him. Um, because one of my goals has always been to be able to have more freedom with my family. So, and that was before even he was born, but it kind of puts a bit more intensity on that. So it's like, okay, cool. The things that I'm doing now are things that will move the needle towards that particular goal. Versus before it was easy to spend, you know, some hours doing this and some hours doing that. Things that weren't really moving the needle, but maybe made me feel better. Um, so it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely done that. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I do remember once when I, I explained to the children that I rejigged my my diary so I could spend more time with them and it was they they were, mm -hmm. they were at that awkward teenage stage where they were like yeah but actually we're okay we don't need to have that time with you but it what it meant was they knew that I was available to them at all times mm -hmm. when they when they needed me and we have a great relationship together and it is but it is just understanding that the freedom was there to be able to do so because of the choices that I'd made and as you said the creation of the lifestyle and it's not just something that happens by chance you have to really work towards creating what it is you want to happen so mm -hmm. I'm loving the the shift in priority and the new level of of parenthood has has come in there so it, it, that's really great from a sense of intent intentional clarity and focus freeman how would people reach out i know you're you're based in canada but with the joys of social media and internet we can all be in one place yeah so thankfully i've scored pretty much every social tag um just at freeman beals so wherever you're on whatever platform you're on uh except for twitter because i'm not i don't I'm not on twitter never have been or x as um, it's now called <laughs> It's changed. Oh, I missed yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. I'm behind on my social media platforms. Uh, but everything else, I'm uh, at Freeman Beals. Um, most of my journey lives on LinkedIn. Um, I guess probably, you know, um, when this comes out, it'll be interesting to see where Threads is at maybe. I'm certainly active on there uh, at Freeman Beals. Plan to be more so. Uh, and then my website is also just freemanbeals.com just to really make it easy for everybody. 
perfect. Well, I'll make sure all the links go into the show notes. Uh, anybody can just click on, on that. So thank you so much for sharing why you do what you do and why you are who you are, where this incredible journey has taken you. And we don't know where it's going to take you going forward, but we know that you have the mission to be affecting practical positivity on as many people as you can so i'm looking forward to the the happier healthier you book coming out soon as well it sounds amazing so thank you do you have some final words for the audience i do actually there is one uh it'll be my book but i'll tell people it now because i believe this is if there's one thing that you can do right now so everybody listening um this is this is what could really help change sort of the world actually and it's easy to do the one thing you can do to start immediately start living a more positive life. This is really easy is write three positive things down every day before you go to bed, whether you write it down in your phone, which shouldn't be in your bedroom, but that's a bigger topic um, in in a journal voice note, however, you have to capture it, capture three good things that happened each day. And this is backed by science is a man called Dr. Daniel Amons, who, who does this as well. Um, and this can start to change those neural pathways in your brain and actually make you happier and, and more positive on a daily basis. So that would be the one quick silver bullet I have for people. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.